Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Never want to pull any punches with his analysis. Economic commentator Eddie Hobbs has very definitive views about economic recovery after COVID, and he joins me now to share his thoughts on this very subject. Eddie, as we begin our second lockdown, there is much concern about the type of economic recovery which will develop after the pandemic has ended. And while we have high hopes of a COVID-19 vaccine on the horizon, there's no such financial vaccine on the way. There's a kind of a climate change situation going on with regards to cash and banks and government bonds now because throughout the world, debt is increasing rapidly, national level in particular, and the IMF has completely changed its tune because they see that at the other end of this, you know, there'll be a massive bounce out of economies from suppressed demand, really, for goods and services. So the calculations show that, you know, by the end of next year on this current path, the US might be back to where it was at the end of 2019 in Europe. Europe will probably be 5, five, five or 6 percent below where it was at, at that stage. The UK the same. So, you know, that's the big bet. So the economies should come back quite quickly. Uh, the question is the cost. And the only way uh, that, the, that all of this debt uh, can be serviced uh, is to keep interest rates at zero or negative, I think, for the next decade or, or longer. Uh, and that the game really will be to allow inflation to erode the real value of the, of the debt. Now, you might say, well, that sounds very highfalutin. What does it mean for me? It means that your money in the bank, your money in unpost, is going to uh, get slaughtered over the next decade, really, versus inflation, that there'll be significant losses in the real value of it. So if you take the way negative interest rates are today in, in banks, if that, that filters down into ordinary deposits, which I believe it will over the next year or so, um, and we get modest rates of inflation, you know, after about five years of that, about one-eighth of your money will have been lost in real terms. If it goes on for 10 years, quarter of it. Eddie, if we go back 10 years and look at the way Europe handled that particular recession, it was driven by austerity. The opposite is happening this time around. It is. The IMF are basically throwing their hands in the air and saying, we got it wrong. Thanks very much, lads. It's 10 years too late to be telling us that. Um, And really, the way to go through this is to um, have the state become much bigger, much bigger player in economies and flood money in where the private sector uh, basically is in, in a state of collapse in large parts of the economy for as long as it is in a state of collapse and, uh, and, then, um, and then deal with the consequences of, of doing that further down the road. And there are significant consequences. None of these things happen without consequences. Uh, so I think that's the change. Uh, we have to be careful that, uh, you know, believing that, you know, it's like the fairy godmother, uh, you can just print whatever you like and borrow whatever you like because it sure doesn't cost nothing. But, of course, it does. Uh, there, are, there are costs. It, it adds on to the national debt. That will have to be rolled over, you know, 10 years, 15 years' time. Um, and uh, I don't think, by the way, there's any chance of interest rates rising over the period. Uh, can't see that happening without collapsing economies. And that's why deposits and bonds are in such terrible jeopardy. Um, so I think there's a, there's, there's a sea change going on globally. So, Eddie, although the government can borrow at negative interest rates for the foreseeable future, is your concern focused on the problem which will arise in the next decade? Well, there'll be other uh, issues along the way. Uh, What we've we've had really 10 years ago, uh, and this isn't a philosophical point, it's just a practical point, we have had uh, a creation of a new economic system by accident. So the the, 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 the kind of normal destruction and renewal cycle that takes place in, in free markets uh, where companies fail, other companies come through and take over with better people, better ideas, more innovation, higher productivity. All of that has been arrested. Uh, big companies and governments have been basically on central bank dole. And, um, and we have these what's known as zombie companies in large parts of various economies that have been sustained purely on the basis of crushing interest rates and making money cheap. Uh, and they're just getting in the way. So I've often described to people, if, if you're in your kitchen and you have a sponge, uh, and it's very effective in cleaning up at the start, but the more water it takes on, the less effective it becomes. So we, we're like a big sponge. The more and more we do this, the more water goes into the sponge, and it becomes less and less effective. So the, uh, the impact of all of this money printing, quantitative easing, etc., uh, is to create a sluggishness in economies. They just get heavy and weary 
and and tepid. Uh, so if you if you net out all of the growth from technology, which is just going gangbusters and its own on its own track, there's not a lot happening beyond that. But Eddie, with the speed that COVID-19 developed in Ireland, surely the government didn't have the opportunity, nor the time, to separate the viable from the zombie companies when they were rolling out the range of supports. That's true. I mean, there was a crisis reaction. The uh, Globally, central banks decided, especially if the Fed changes policy, ECB has followed the same policy, basically, to, uh, to, to, to support the corporate bond market. So these are bonds that are issued by really, really big companies and they're quoted on stock exchanges uh, you can buy and sell them, uh, so they're 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 basically supporting. They're the backstop for that. So effectively, the Fed, if you want to look at it, like the global central bank, is is underwriting the uh, the the the, uh, the stock market uh, so through through the um, through the corporate bond market, as well as underwriting. You know, the words backing as a backstop for uh, lending to national governments, and um, and like that's a, that's fine in theory and laboratory tests. Governments can get bigger, they can become more involved in economies, but they, they can crowd out the private sector then and, and they can allow these companies to continue on in existence when they really are badly in need of reform and starve the oxygen then out of very innovative companies and that's very bad for economies. What do you think the economy is going to look like at the other side of this? Oh, that's a million dollar question. We don't know yet is the answer to that. We do know that the, um, uh, you know, the, the whole... Um, commercial office world is obviously being turned upside down as we speak. Uh, that's going to be causing a lot of pain for pension funds and investors who are exposed to that area. Uh, you know, working from home is becoming a, a permanent change. Companies are implementing it as policy now, not just temporary policy. Uh, that's going to have a big impact on the way we work, uh, the way where we live, uh, if, if, if we even do commute. Uh, and, and how we coordinate and collaborate together. So it is, that's quite exciting, that kind of change, because it can, it can create uh, some, some positive uh, developments for us. And on the topic of property, what's your outlook for house prices over the next three to five years? Well, I mean, to, to have a stab at that, I'd say that the, like globally there are some very serious uh, risks out there in the property market uh, where uh, there, was, there was already bubbles in existence, like, for example, Australia, parts of Canada, um, Stockholm, parts of Germany, um, uh, and Ireland, however, this time round, we're actually in pretty good nick. We've had our banking crisis. We had our property collapse. We we're not going to. We, we weren't racing to go back there again, even though politicians would like us to have to have done so by trying to force the uh, the ceiling off the central bank's restriction on lending, which would have been a really bad idea. Uh, so we we haven't had a debt fuel property bubble. Uh, we have a property uh, market, really, which is propped up by our very strong demographics. So we need far greater supply, better planning, all the rest of the stuff. All of that stuff is pretty well rehearsed. I don't see that changing in a hurry. So I don't see Ireland uh, going through a kind of a property collapse, anything like it before. There may be some, 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 some location areas, some, some, some modest price falls, but nothing, not, nothing like a collapse which will bring down people's balance sheets and destroy banks and nothing like that. Nothing dramatic like that again, certainly in my lifetime, I hope. In terms of increased taxation to repay some of this debt, when do you see it coming and how will it manifest itself? Well, firstly, bear in mind that the actual annual servicing cost of our debt is falling, even though we're adding more debt. And that's because the profile of the debt that we've got is extended out by the NTMA. Quite, They've done a great job over the last 10 years and, and, uh, I mean, we're, and that's the crazy world we're in. That uh, the, of, of negative interest rates are flat or zero to negative interest rates, which isn't going to change. So I don't see a debt a servicing crisis coming coming up anytime soon. Um, but what the government will be hoping is that the uh, that growth in the economy will bring the debt to GDP level or debt to GNI level uh, below 100% again uh, within the next number of years, and then we'll grow our way out of it. Um, so that's the plan. The Americans have the same plan. Everybody has the same plan that, you know, growth will do it. Uh, but my point is that that's all very fine. Um, but the cost of, of keeping interest rates zero or negative for 10 years or so is going to crush people's, the value of people's money in government bonds and in, uh, and in cash deposits. Once we get to the other side of this, we're going to see the likes of the pandemic unemployment payments, the employment wage support schemes discontinued. At that stage, are you fearful that we'll be entering back down the road into a banking crisis? Globally, uh, the, the, to answer that question globally first, the, the, uh, the weakest part of the, uh, the debt market out there is, the, is what is known as leverage loans. Carl, it's about $5 trillion globally. 
of loans that have been given to companies that were already highly leveraged. Um, and um, and those obviously those loans in the in the areas that are now heavily impacted by COVID-19 are, are are causing problems. About a fifth of that five trillion load has been securitised, in other words, packaged together in bundles of 100 loans or more, and and basically passed around to banks, insurance funds, insurance companies have got them on their balance sheets. Pension funds have got them on their balance sheets. They're known as collateralised loan obligations. I see those detonating. Uh, and that will cause uh, that will spill out then over into the next ring of debt, which is uh, uh, which is um, uh, mortgage-backed securities, which are quoted on markets. And uh, these collateralised mortgage-backed securities uh, are going, to, you know, the area, the same areas are going to cause a problem. And th- those bad debts are going to start hitting banks. Certain banks will be fine with it. Other banks are going to need to be recapitalised. Then we're back into which will be who will be saved and who won't be saved. The European banking system is not as strong as the American banking system from a buffer's perspective, uh, and it also has a lot of exposure towards the leveraged loan market, and that's where, the, that's where it's first going to come. Beyond that, of course, you're right, uh, consumer loans, um, consumer debt is going to be a problem because forbearance programs can't go on forever, and, uh, and banks' capital, uh, you know, the, the, when, when banks are faced with the you know, with a huge uncertain load coming their, their, their way in form of non, uh, it, non-performing loans. The first thing that they do is they try to protect their capital. And the way they do, the way they protect their capital buffers, even though they won't say it, is that they implement a credit squeeze. And uh, so they tighten up credit, uh, in, and, and, and that's a negative for the economy. And, of course, that then creates an opportunity for shadow banking operators to come in and start lending. And these are un, you know, uh, some of these are unregulated, uh, we don't. We just don't know how much money has been lent through the shadow banking market in Ireland, and, and that's where we're going to go. So, will it cause a collapse in the banking system again? No. Uh, next time around, it will be much quicker. It will be solved much quicker because the systems and institutions are now in place. Like, for example, the Financial Stability Board, which is set up to look at this. So, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that they've got their plans in place, and all that will happen is that they'll print whatever is necessary to shore up the systemically important banks. The big question is which banks will, will be deemed not systemically important and which banks will be not too big to fail, but actually too big to save. And Eddie, for your clients that have a large cash pile, what advice are you giving them today? Well, everybody's different. It depends on, on, on one's circumstances. I, I think the first thing that people need to understand is that if you leave money in the bank, you're going to lose, it's going to leak. So therefore, in order to, if you want to try and get a return of 4 or 5% a year currently, yeah, you need to uh, invest in, in, in risky assets. That's just the law of the jungle. Um, but the, unfortunately, the, the stock market is very high at the moment in terms of prices, uh, so you have to be very careful in, in how you go about doing this. Uh, but there will be opportunities as, uh, as we move along over the next year or so uh, where there's big dips in prices to go in and get value and then buckle down and... Uh, and let, your, and let your investments play out over the next 10 years or so. But the idea of keeping everything in, in cash in the bank because you're fearful of doing anything is fine, uh, but it's going to cost. Um, pension funds are going to have real problems because the, 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 the mainstay of their investments, which is government bonds, are going to be giving negative returns. And then with Brexit on the horizon and the UK offering far more attractive capital gains tax rates, do you expect many of the next generation of Irish entrepreneurs to build their startups in the UK? I do, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how we react or respond to it, we have a very serious uh, economic threat uh, on our, on, uh, just next door. And that's the UK, whether it has a thin uh, deal or not uh, in January, it's, it's already committed to uh, attracting mobile startup capital from wherever it can get it. Uh, and the way they're doing that is that uh, they allow people to establish businesses, develop employment, and then sell the businesses to the next round of investors, you know, years down along the road, where the first 10 million uh, is it at a very, very reduced rate of capital gains tax. So in Ireland, in, uh, our response with so far is just to bring in entrepreneurs relief, but we've set ours at a million. So we need to match the UK, if not exceed the UK, in order to compete against it for this mobile capital, because that's where the next, uh, you know, that's where the next big Google, uh, Microsoft uh, players are going to come from. They're going to come from that pond. 
Now, we, to do that, we need to have a completely different uh, approach to how we go about um, not just getting startups, but actually helping them all the way through to IPOs. Uh, you know, there hasn't been a major IPO of an Irish startup on the Irish Stock Exchange in the technology area for, for 20 or 30 years. Because they're inclined to go off to the United States. Why, why is that? I mean, why, why, why aren't we doing it here? And one of the main principal reasons for it, in my opinion, is that behind all of this, when you, when you cut into it, you will see that at official level, I mean Department of Finance level, and I mean at establishment level, there's, an, there's, a, there's a deep, long-held suspicion of the indigenous Irish uh, community. Of course, when we talk about the US, we're at the final furlong of the US election. If Biden is elected, is that going to be good for Ireland? Well, I think it will, actually. Uh, Wall Street, there was a significant shift. When I say Wall Street, it's just a term to describe asset managers and so on. There was a significant shift over the summer when uh, well, Wall Street started to uh, turn on Trump and started to talk about him maybe being unelectable. Then there was a big amount of nervousness about him uh, not, not, not losing by enough. Um, and that's, you know, as the gap has opened up between Biden and Trump, uh, although I think it's much narrower than the polls indicate, um, the, the, the idea of, of Trump messing around um, and creating all sorts of mayhem uh, in their institutions, that has diminished. Um, they're looking at Biden. They see Biden coming in with $7 trillion of stimulus, which is going to, you know, a lot of that is going into education. Some of it is going into social services and health which is good, and, uh, and he's $2 trillion earmarked for infrastructure. I mean, that's absolute um, crack cocaine for stock markets. They love it, and, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, and, of course, on the other side, then, he's, he, he hopes to recover about half of that $7 trillion, $3.5 trillion in increased taxes, corporate tax in particular, income tax over $400,000 a year, etc. So um, what markets are, are praying for is that Biden wins dramatically he wins well uh, and that the democrats i think the big thing really would be can the democrats take the senate if they take the senate and they have congress and they come in with this package the american economy will respond very robustly well if you've just tuned in that was eddie hobbs and i'd like to thank eddie for providing us with such a candid interview this morning southeast radio's business matters with carl fitzpatrick